Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society. Hey there, Team Canada. Elbows up, eh? <laughs> the most recent event that came out of the Premier's meeting is that Premier Tim Houston of Nova Scotia is proposing that his little province could supply 27% of the electrical energy required by Canada from a 66 gigawatt offshore wind farm. So if people are familiar with the Canadian American grid, most of our interconnections are north and south. These are for economic reasons and in fact both countries rely quite heavily on each other for load balancing and for shortages. For instance, British Columbia has been a net importer of electricity from the States for the past three years because of the drought there. So Tim Houston's proposal sounds pretty good to those who don't know anything about how the power grid operates, but if you're planning on building a 66 gigawatt wind farm, you better look at the costs involved. First of all, in the news, it's been reported that the transmission line, the connector line from this offshore wind farm would cost about $8 billion. So that doesn't sound like tons of money in an economy that is two trillion dollars a year GDP. But it is tons of money when you look at the wind farm, which would cost between 60 to 80 billion dollars. That's a lot of money. Where's that going to come from? In most cases, offshore wind farms are subsidized by taxpayers. And the easiest thing we can do is look at the UK. The UK has been building offshore wind farms for some time. And the problem is that these wind farms are proposed at one cost, but the costs escalate quickly because it's a very difficult environment to build in out at sea. Tropical storm Fiona has battered eastern Canada, leaving devastation in its wake. Houses were washed into the sea and hundreds of thousands of people are left without power as winds up to 100 miles per hour bring down power lines. Not to mention the fact that most of these wind farms are proposed to run for decades, but they actually only can operate successfully for about 15 to 20 years. So that means in 15 to 20 years, you're going to have to spend another 60 to 80 billion dollars to rebuild. Uh, these are astronomical costs. And of course, there are other problems. In the United States, one turbine fell apart and the and the uh, blade fell into the water but it turns out that it's made up of a lot of fiberglass and this fiberglass shredded and infested the water along a beach area that people used to enjoy so now it's a danger to the public it's a danger to uh, all the fish in the ocean it's a danger to wildlife in the area and it's very difficult to clean this type of stuff up because the ocean has dispersed it all over the place. So, you know, on the one hand, people in Nova Scotia are very proud of the Sable Islands and the wild horses there that have lived there for a long time. Beautiful horses. And yet they want to put a wind farm out at sea, an enormous wind farm. What else are wind farms known for? killing birds, seabirds. So do we want to decimate the seabird population off the east coast of Canada? But if we go back to the electricity issue, the real problem is that when you build 66 gigawatts of power, the most that you can get sort of westward is 33 gigawatts because you have what's called line losses along the way. There's resistance within the line. And another problem is that if you have 27% of Canada's electricity supposedly coming from Nova Scotia, what happens when the wind dies? Now in Premier Houston's presentation, he says that the wind there is very stable 60% of the time. Sounds great. What happens in the 40%? You have to have an equivalent, firm, um, conventional provider of electricity for the, that period of time. And if you don't have it, guess what happens? The power grid goes to black. So potentially national blackouts, because what happens is all the system is built with these um, breakers in them. So if there's even a minor variation 
in the power generation, these breakers will trip to protect all the equipment down the line. So what will happen is you'll have a cascade of tripping breakers, rather like they had in Spain and Portugal on the day that Mr. Net Zero, Mark Carney, was elected as Prime Minister of Canada. So, yes, Spain and Portugal reached net zero early, <laughs> and it meant that the whole country was in blackout for over a day. They were just lucky that they were able to get their power grid back up and running. So, too much renewables on the grid, not a good idea, and the costs of such a project are absolutely astronomical, and they will not solve the problem that we have interconnecting ties between the US and Canada that benefit both countries. That's been built up over the past 100 years, and that's not gonna change overnight. So elbows up, people, but keep those green delusions down. For Friends of Science Society, I'm Michelle Sterling.